the same religion that's capable of hideous acts of destruction can also be capable of moments of healing, of restoration, and of hope. But educate a girl, and you educate her entire family. There is a sun within every person. When that anger sets in, write it. Write the letters, but don't send them. You never want to leave concrete proof of insanity. I have some great people and organizations to thank for sponsoring our visit uh, tonight. Uh, our Arts and Lectures Program, Patagonia, the College of Letters and Science, the Donald Bren School of Environmental Science and Management, the Division of Social Science and the Division of Humanities and Fine Arts in the College of Letters and Science, and John Wiley and Sons Incorporated, the publishers of the book. Thank you. I also want to thank the UCSB Libraries for taking the lead in the UCSB Reads program. It's a program that's designed to get the entire university community reading and talking about an important issue and one that intersects our interdisciplinary themes on the campus. Of course, this year we've chosen to focus on globalization, and they're not here tonight, but I want to recognize Duncan and Suzanne Mellishamp, uh, who are the uh, providers of the four Mellishamp chairs in globalization that we're recruiting for this year. I also want to recognize partners in the overall UCSB's, uh, UCSB Reads program this year. Uh, Patagonia is our major sponsor. A thousand of the Patagonia employees are also reading the book with us this year. The Santa Barbara Public Library, which has promoted this book as one of their own UCSB Reads choices. They've been sponsoring five community conversations about the book in their various branches. Our campus radio station, KCSB, which has been broadcasting a reading of the book by local community members, and I hope you've been listening to that. Santa Barbara City College, which has joined us in the read this year, and the Santa Barbara Public High Schools, which have placed copies of the book in their libraries. I'm also happy to announce that the first UCSB Reads program, which we began last year and focused on an environmental theme, global warming, has received two major awards. The first from the Council for the Advancement and Support of Education, and the second, a very prestigious award called the John Cotton Dana Award from the American Library Association. So I congratulate all those that participated in this last year on being recognized for that great work. Okay, now on to my introduction. In many ways, Pietra Rivoli does not need an introduction at UC Santa Barbara since we've all been busy reading her book, but to do her justice and to make sure everyone here tonight is familiar with her background, I'll provide a short intro. Pietra received her PhD in Finance and International Economics at the University of Florida. She currently is an associate professor in the McDonough School of Business at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. She has been on the faculty at Georgetown since 1983 and teaches finance and international business in the undergraduate, graduate, and executive programs. Professor Rivoli has special interest in social justice issues in international business and in China and she regularly leads MBA residencies to China. In fact, she's just getting back from a trip tonight. Her academic research has been published in numerous leading journals, including the Journal of International Business Studies, Business Ethics Quarterly, and Journal of Money, Credit, and Banking. In 2006, Professor Rivoli was awarded a Faculty Pioneer Award by the Aspen Institute. This award recognizes business school faculty who have been leaders in the integration of social and environmental, environmental issues into MBA curricula. Professor Rivoli's recent book, and the full title is The Travels of a T-Shirt in the Global Economy, An Economist Examines the Markets, Power, and Politics of World Trade, has been widely acclaimed by both the popular press and the academic community as a path-breaking study of globalization. Professor Rivoli's book has received numerous awards and these honors include the following, being named one of the best business books of the year by the Financial Times, Booz Allen Hamilton, Foreign Affairs, The Library Journal, and by Amazon.com. Being named as a finalist for the inaugural Financial Times Goldman Sachs Book of the Year Award, and being designated by the American Association of Publishers as the best scholarly book 
of 2005 in the category of finance and economics. Translations of the book are underway in, and this is an update, I had originally 12, now 14 languages. I know that we've all enjoyed reading it and participating in the discussions it has evoked, so we're all excited and delighted to have the author here tonight. I know that everyone agrees with everything I wrote in the book, so that always tends to make the dialogue uh, more interesting. But you know, in all seriousness, there are many different points of view that you can bring to the study of globalization. Um, I brought, I think, a particular point of view, but I also brought a particular approach. Uh, my book is really just a biography. Okay? It's a biography in the sense that it's a life story. It's the life story of a very simple thing in our global economy today. And my idea in writing this book is to use the biography, to use the life story of a simple thing to illuminate much more complex issues. I have a bit of a, a hero, if you will, or a role model in a history professor at Harvard. Her name, and you maybe have heard of her, she's actually won a Nobel Prize, her name is Laurel Ulrich. Laurel Ulrich has this to say, my challenge and excitement is to see if everyday objects can answer questions that written documents cannot. Okay. Um, and this makes sense, of course, from the perspective of a history professor, but I think it's also a very exciting way to examine trade, to examine international business, to examine uh, international economics. What can this everyday object that you and I are all familiar with teach us about these very complicated topics? So the book's a biography. It's a life story. I actually bought, uh, brought the T-shirt the because sometimes people like to see it. This is the t-shirt the that is the, the star of the book. This is the t-shirt that I wrote the book about. So some of you may remember there's a parrot on it. Well, here's the t-shirt, here's the parrot. Okay. Uh, let me begin tonight uh, by just briefly sketching the life story of the t-shirt. And the easiest way to do that uh, is by looking at uh, the travels of this t-shirt on a map. Okay. Uh, so if you've read the book, you're familiar with the basic bio, uh, biographical facts of the story. My t-shirt was born in West Texas. Uh, West Texas is one of the most uh, important cotton growing regions of the world. So I first went to West Texas to try to understand more about how this global industry works. I have to admit that before I got on the plane to Lubbock, Texas, I had probably every snotty East Coast bias it was possible to have about people in Lubbock, Texas. Um, you know, I thought they were all Republicans and I was a Democrat. Uh, I thought they all had guns and I didn't like guns. I thought they all uh, went to church all the time and behaved and, and I didn't do really either one of those things. And uh, so I, I landed, you know, in Lubbock, Texas with, you know, preconceived ideas about, about where I was headed. Uh, my preconceptions turned out to be wrong. Uh, Lubbock, Texas has turned into one of my favorite places in the universe. I have so many friends there. I go back whenever I can. Uh, Lubbock was a wonderful place for me to start this journey. Okay. Uh, why do I say that? Uh, I say it because uh, the production of cotton, the global trade in cotton, viewed from the, the standpoint of Lubbock, Texas, is completely transparent. Okay? Uh, I could walk into any cotton gin, any cotton farm, uh, any cotton extension service around Lubbock, Texas. People would drop what they were doing, explain to me clearly uh, whatever it was I wanted to know, whether it was about ginning or picking cotton or what have you, and then they'd buy me lunch. Okay? And then they'd usually invite me to a barbecue. Okay? Um, the, the point is that the landscape in Lubbock is completely open, uh, and the people are that way too. And so it was a very easy place to start my research because everything uh, was above board. Everything was on the table. Uh, everything was very easy to understand. Okay? Uh, I next, however, had to follow this cotton to China because in China, the raw cotton was spun into yarn and knit into fabric and ultimately turned into a t-shirt. So I next went to China uh, to figure out how this global industry worked. And China, of course, was a much more challenging place to do research because while Lubbock was completely transparent, China 
uh, often even to the Chinese, uh, seems very opaque. Okay? Uh, it's difficult to figure out what's going on in China. On the one hand, you, you, you're struck by the miracle economy. On the other hand, you're struck by uh, you know, a one-party dictatorship that still uses some very brutal tactics. Uh, on the one hand, you'd have somebody explain things to you another way, and then you'd ask the same question a little bit later, and you get a different answer. Uh, my, my point is that the research was difficult. It was difficult to dig down in China to figure out uh, what was really going on. But of course, it was absolutely uh, fascinating. And I'm still, of course, trying to figure out China. Uh, once the t-shirt was produced, it came back to the United States, which is, of course, where I purchased it. Now, this might seem to be a relatively simple logistical matter of the t-shirt hopping onto a ship and coming back to, uh, to the U.S., but in fact, the journey back was very complicated. And the reason it was complicated is because the t-shirt had to make its way through a very complex maze of trade policies and trade rules. Okay? And so in the next part of the book, what I try to do is understand those rules, where they came from, how they work, and what the consequences of them were. Okay? Now, in trying to understand trade politics, um, I was pretty much based in Washington, where I live. Okay? Now, you'd think that that would be an easy place to do research. I mean, after all, I live there and I speak the language. Uh, but actually, Washington, in, in its own way, was every bit as difficult as China in terms of um, efforts to try to figure out what was really going on. Uh, the difficulties were different, however. Uh, my main problem in Washington is that I was a nobody. And if you're a nobody in Washington, then what happens when you pick up the phone is, you know, the aide to the aide of Senator such and such will give you five minutes, three weeks from Tuesday, and they have an angle, you know, that they're trying to, to give you. Okay? And so, uh, as in, and in Washington, everybody's very concerned, you know, with power and with status. And if you're a nobody where people have no reason to try to uh, make friends with you, you know, it's very difficult to figure out what, what, you know, what goes on. Uh, much more difficult than in Lubbock. And, but I did, you know, I, I persisted, and I tried to dig in to figure out how this policy-making process worked. Uh, but it, it was a challenge, you know, even speaking the language. Okay. Uh, once the t-shirt, once our t-shirts, and I see a lot of you have on t-shirts tonight, uh, once we're finished with our t-shirts in the United States, uh, what tends to happen to them is we drop them in a Salvation Army bin. Okay. And so it occurred to me that I really didn't know uh, once my t-shirt, of course I haven't thrown it away, but I, my question was, well, what really happens to this t-shirt if I were to throw it away and if it did go into the Salvation Army bin? Uh, and there I came upon the next part and the last part of this story uh, because it's such an interesting uh, global industry. What happens is, of course, uh, all of us have way too many old t-shirts, and so we're always getting rid of them. But if you turn to your left and your right and you look at the person next to you and you say, well, would I want that person's old t-shirt, um, the answer is probably no, right? And so where are all these old t-shirts going to go okay, if we're all throwing them away? Uh, of course, an excess supply like that uh, goes somewhere. Uh, some of those t-shirts do in fact stay in the United States, but the great majority of them uh, the, are sold by Goodwill, by the Salvation Army for a few cents a pound, and they then enter the global used clothing trade. Most light, weight and light colored clothing ends up being exported to Africa. And so I did a little research on that and I found out that for Tanzania, this very poor country on the east coast of Africa, used clothing was actually America's largest export. So we sell more used clothing to Tanzania than we sell anything else. And so I decided that that was my final stop. That's where I would go to investigate the end of the story. Okay. So I've been then, uh, you know, across these three continents, across these three global industries. Um, and again, the basic biographical sketch is up on the map. What's been very interesting to me is to see the very different gut reactions uh, people have to this map. Okay. 
Okay. Even without knowing anything else or evaluating any of the arguments, you know, some people look at this map, you know, this, this global travel uh, that this t-shirt has taken, and they think, you know, wow, that's cool. Uh, they see kind of this marvelous uh, machine of the global economy. Uh, they see creation, you know, creation of markets for cotton farmers in Texas, creation of jobs for seamstresses in China, uh, creation of clothing for you and I, sort of this marvelous machine that creates and spreads wealth. Okay. But some people look at this map uh, and think instead, oh, that's awful. Okay. Um, and in the same exact picture, instead of seeing creation, they see destruction. Uh, and it's true that a lot has been destroyed in the past few generations. The story of a typical t-shirt, uh, even just 25 years ago, took place on a tiny, tiny piece of this world map. The cotton was probably still from Texas, but the yarn and fabric were probably manufactured in North Carolina, and the t-shirt itself was probably made in the Deep South, Alabama or Mississippi. So this very wide-ranging uh, trip that the t-shirt now takes actually was once um, all taking place within a few hundred miles. Okay. And that means there has, in fact, been destruction. You know, there's been destruction of the textile communities in North Carolina. There's been destruction, people say, of the way of life of many women in Asia who've been pulled into these factories. Okay. Um, so what's interesting to me is that, you know, there are these very different gut reactions based on this picture, which is a simple uh, biographical sketch. Okay. Uh, you know, to give away a little bit of the, the punchline here, you know, I do come down, I think, uh, not unambiguously, but I do come down on the positive side of the story. Uh, I'm generally an optimist about the future of globalization. I do believe that for most people in most countries, life is getting better along many dimensions. And I believe that uh, open borders can take a fair bit of credit for improvement in the, the human condition. I also believe that in many cases, the good old days just weren't that great. Okay? And so I think that my basic you know, positive reaction you know, to this map uh, puts me on one side of this debate, no doubt. Now, does that mean I think that there are, you know, that all is rosy? Um, absolutely not. Okay. And what I'd like to talk about next um, uh, is at least one challenge I'll start with uh, that I see in the future of globalization and one challenge that I observed continuously uh, throughout my research. Okay. Uh, let me explain this through uh, a couple of the people in the t-shirt story. Okay. Uh, the challenge what causes me pause when I am trying to be an optimist is something that I've come to call the tenured professor problem. Okay. Uh, what's the tenured professor problem? Okay. The tenured professor problem is the fact that people with power get to write the rules. Okay. And when they can, they will write the rules in a way that protects themselves. In the course of protecting myself, however, I often am exposing or hurting somebody else. Okay? That's my definition of the tenured professor problem. Now, what does that have to do with tenured professors? Well, I have tenure at Georgetown University. This is a very good deal. Uh, it means they can never fire me. Okay? So I am protected by these rules, by the rules of the university that have given me tenure. Okay? Um, now, regardless of whether the tenure policy is good or bad from a more global perspective, we have to recognize that even though it's good for me and it protects me, it does expose others. So it could well be that there's somebody down the hall outside the building at Georgetown who can teach twice as well as me for half the price. Okay? Uh, but they are excluded from this game. They're excluded from competing. Uh, because I have this job locked up, and it's locked up because the rules have been written to protect me. Okay? Uh, and so the fact that I'm protected means this other person out there is somehow exposed, right? Now, who do you think thought up tenure? Okay. 
Well, you know, it's a probably a pretty safe bet that it was professors, right? Uh, so if you give us the ability to write the rules, there is this tendency to write them to protect ourselves, okay? Um, and again, I'm not saying that tenure is bad policy. I'm just saying that there is a negative effect on those outside the system. Now, what does this have to do with the t-shirt? Okay. Uh, in my research into this topic, I kept coming upon different versions of the tenured professor problem. And one of my reservations about how the global economy works today uh, has come from my repeated observation of this problem in various contexts. For example, on your upper left are the cotton farmers that I wrote about in my book. Uh, their names, you might remember, are Nelson and Ruth Reinch. Okay? Uh, two very close friends of mine now. I have tremendous admiration for them and their neighbors in Texas. Uh, but we have to recognize that agricultural interests in the United States, cotton farmers quite particularly, have tenure. Okay? They are protected by a set of rules that are largely of their own creation. Okay? Um, these rules are many and varied. Uh, most directly, they're protected by very extensive government subsidies. Okay? Uh, over the past 10 years, about a third of American cotton farmers' income has come from federal subsidies. Now you might say, well, who does that hurt besides the taxpayer? Well, what happens is, of course, because we subsidize the production of cotton, people grow more and more cotton, and that depresses the world market price of cotton. And so the effect then is felt by farmers in poor countries, particularly in West Africa, uh, where they could compete if the market price were higher and they got the, or they got those subsidies too. But instead they can't compete, they're effectively handicapped in this game because of the protective rules that benefit American cotton farmers. Now this is one of the most contentious debates uh, in the world trade talks today. In fact, it's American agricultural subsidies that are really the stumbling block right now in world trade negotiations. But it's an example of what I call the tenured professor problem. One group in the global economy is exposed because another is protected. Okay. Another example of this is on your lower right. Okay. Uh, this picture was taken in Brussels, Belgium. You might say, well, who are these guys? Uh, this is a group of leaders of the textile industries of various countries. So you've got a head textile guy there from the U.S., uh, from Mexico, from France, uh, so forth and so on. What are they all doing together in Belgium? Okay. Well, you probably can guess. Um, they are gathered there to try to figure out how to rework the rules in their favor to protect their industries in their countries. Now, uh, in blunt terms, what they're doing is they're sitting around scratching their heads saying, oh my gosh, what are we going to do about China? Okay? That's what they're really doing. Okay? Um, now you'd think and you learn you know, in business school that you know, what these guys are really about is just trying to produce the best t-shirts at the best price. Okay? Uh, but that's only a partial recipe for success in business um, because even if I don't produce the best t-shirts at the best price, if I can get the rules written in such a way to protect me, I'll be okay. okay? And that is partly what uh, happens in uh, international uh, negotiations over trade rules. And in fact, these guys were quite successful in imposing limits um, on the export of clothing from China into the United States. Uh, they were successful in, in rigging the rules in various ways uh, to protect their industry, to protect themselves, even though they didn't really have the best t-shirts at the best price. Um, so that is another example of the tenured professor problem. Okay? Uh, now, if you look on the upper right, you see my friend Jeffrey Malange. Okay? Jeffrey Malange is at his used t-shirt store in Dar es Salaam, uh, the capital of Tanzania. And just as an aside, I had a, an amazing little story uh, for you. A couple of months ago, I guess late in the fall, I got an email. And someone said, Dear Professor Rivoli, 
I was just reading your book. I came upon the picture of, of Jeffrey Malange on page such and such. Uh, and I just have to tell you, that's my shirt. Okay. Okay. And he went on to tell me how he had argued with his wife. His wife wanted to, uh, to toss it. He wanted to keep it. His wife won. It got tossed, and, and there it was. Okay. Um, but in any case, Jeffrey Malange is an example of someone in the global economy today who doesn't have tenure. Okay. Uh, Jeffrey Malange lives by selling the best t-shirts at the best price to his customers. Okay. There are no rules to protect him. He operates in a very competitive market. Okay. And if the t-shirt seller down the block has, has a better one or a cheaper one, uh, then all he can do is try to uh, compete on quality or on price. There's nothing he can do going back to uh, the Dar es Salaam or to Washington to try to rig the rules in his favor. Okay. So these are the kind of injustices uh, that, as I wrote this book, were, were salient to me. Uh, the injustices that arise from how the rules get written for whose protection and for whose benefit. Finally, we can talk about the woman on the lower left. Her name is He Huan Ji. Okay. Uh, she's a garment worker in Shanghai. She's uh, there at her cutting machine in this picture. Okay. And the reason she's a very important character in this story is that uh, she and her many sisters, uh, particularly in Asia, are really the star character, I would say, in a very evocative image that's used to describe globalization, and that image is the race to the bottom. Okay. What is the race to the bottom? Okay. Well, the race to the bottom story goes something like this. You and I, as consumers, want cheaper and cheaper everything. We want cheaper t-shirts, we want cheaper televisions, we want cheaper shoes, so forth and so on. Okay. The retailers in the United States, in responding to this pressure, try to lower their costs because they know they're only going to sell us t-shirts if theirs are the cheapest. So they push back onto their suppliers in China and elsewhere, pressure to lower and lower the cost of the t-shirt. Now, of course, the result of that is downward pressure uh, on wages, downward pressure on working conditions, essentially our demand for cheaper and cheaper goods uh, ends up costing workers like He Wan Ji because that economic demand we have for cheaper and cheaper is basically downward pressure on the quality of her life. Okay. Now, this is a very pessimistic story with kind of a, a, a bottom that doesn't end uh, because as we want things cheaper and cheaper, it seems that all we can do is, uh, all we can have is, is worse and worse conditions. So how do I square, you know, this pessimistic story uh, with my own optimism? Okay. What is it like, I'll start, uh, to work in one of these factories? Okay. Well, it's pretty bad. Okay. Uh, the pay is low. Right now, about $150 a month, uh, maybe as low as $100. Uh, the freedoms are quite limited. You can take your breaks at this time for this many minutes. Uh, there are many unscrupulous bosses and unscrupulous companies in China. Uh, perhaps worst of all, at least from my perspective, uh, the work, work is just deathly boring. Deathly boring. Now, of course, there are good factories and there are bad factories. Uh, but none of the factories that I've been in in China have I said, boy, I wish I could work there. Okay. Now, the conditions, I think, from the perspective of Westerners, uh, that's, that's, how the, that's how it looks. It, just, it looks bad on numerous dimensions. But there's an irony that I've come to appreciate more and more, and that is that the exploitation of women like He Wan Ji can occur simultaneously with their liberation. Okay. Um, one of the memories that is uh, most cogent to me was actually from a factory visit I made after the book was completed. It was just a, maybe about two years ago. Okay. 
I walked into a factory and I wanted to talk to some of the workers. You look out in one of these factories and you just see hundreds of women sitting at their sewing machines. You know, their heads are down, uh, they're not smiling. But when I looked out at this sea of, of women, there was one who was looking up at me. And so I said, can I talk to her? Okay. And they said, okay. So the woman stood up from her sewing machine and I about fell over because she stood up and she was dressed to kill, like New Year's Eve dressed. Um, she had on these skin tight jeans that were covered with, I'm not sure what you would call them, studs or sequins or, or something. And then she had on these um, spike heel boots, maybe five inches tall. And she had her hair dyed in these kind of funky colors. And I thought, you know, you sit at that sewing machine all day in those shoes, you know. I couldn't even stand up in those shoes. But anyway, she tottered over and we started to talk. Um, those spike heel boots for her were kind of what it was all about. Okay? Uh, she had come from her family's duck farm. Her family raised ducks for sale to restaurants around Beijing. And she had worked on the duck farm for many years and all through her childhood, all through high school. And I asked her what her job on the duck farm was. And, you know, to put it simply, she was in charge of the duck poop. Okay. That was her job. You know, you had to pick it up at a certain time of day and you had to put it in a certain place and so forth and so on. And of course, my first thought was, so I guess you didn't wear those boots. Uh, at your job on the duck farm. Okay. She was so happy to have these boots. And not because she liked the boots, but because it had been her decision to buy them. It had been her own money. She had a level of autonomy in that factory that it was impossible for her to have back in her village. And this meant everything to her. Okay. She knew that her dad wouldn't buy her the boots, even if he had the money. Uh, but she knew that as long as she were making her own money, she had some of her own choices. And whenever I hear about garment workers, whenever I take place in a sweatshop-related discussion, it's very hard for me not to picture this young woman. If you like, you can see her and hear her yourself. Uh, if you go to NPR and search for my book, there's a little, uh, you can hear her, her speaking. Okay? Uh, but in any case, the point is that this very small choice she had about choosing her own clothing was actually made possible by this exploitive workplace. Now that doesn't mean that poor working conditions are okay. It doesn't mean we shouldn't try to change them. Uh, but there is a very complex nuance that these women in Asia are not only victims of globalization, they are also in a different way uh, beneficiaries. Now, a second problem I have with the race to the bottom argument uh, is that by my own eyes, I believe things are getting better, particularly in China. My first visit to a Chinese garment factory was in 1998. My last one was last Wednesday. Okay. And my own eyeballs tell me that things are getting better rather than seeing some kind of downward spiral, instead, with my eyes, I see improvement. So the question then becomes, well, what is the mechanism by which this improvement is taking place? What about this economic logic of the race to the bottom? Okay. Well, if there's a mechanism that we can count on, in effect, to make things better, then, of course, there's some cause for optimism. I think there are a couple of mechanisms at work. Uh, first of all, there's a simple economic mechanism at work. The explosive growth in China, China's cities are growing at a rate of about 12% annually. Uh, in the countryside, it's lower, it's about 6%. The economy is growing, but that's still two to three times what we're seeing in the United States. And so this growth in China creates more opportunities for women like Wanji. She doesn't have to stay at this factory. There are other opportunities in better industries where she can get a job. 
two months ago, there was a labor fair for garment workers in Guangdong province. Okay. 6,000 jobs were listed. Okay. 2,000 potential workers showed up. Okay. So the story that there are somehow millions of women kind of lining up desperate to take these jobs is just simply no longer true, even though it once was true. And so there's an economic dynamic going on there that is forcing these factories to improve conditions, to improve their wages, if they're going to keep the business. Okay. A second mechanism, I think, that's helping to improve things in China are consumers. Okay. Uh, consumers, particularly in Europe and also in America, it's a caricature to say all of us just always want the cheapest thing. Okay. It's not true. You know, if you look at how consumers make choices, we care not only about the products we're buying and their price, we also care about the process uh, by which the products come to us. And if you think about the farmers markets here in Santa Barbara, okay, you know, why do we go to these farmers markets? Well, we go because we're willing to pay more for a process uh, that we uh, feel positive about. And the same thing is happening with many types of goods worldwide, okay? uh, clothing included. The third final and most important thing, however, uh, that is making things better for women in these garment factories is social activism, particularly uh, from the United States, but also from Europe. Okay? This activism started in 1999 uh, as part of a much broader type of activism that was targeting globalization in general. So you may remember uh, the, the kind of takedown of the WTO meetings in Seattle in 1999. Mass protests on the street, uh, effectively the meetings just had to be called off. For the next couple of years, there were these protests all around the world, at World Bank meetings, at WTO meetings, at IMF meetings, so forth and so on. Uh, now, this anti-globalization movement had many disparate groups with very different agendas. But on college campuses, both here at Santa Barbara, at Georgetown, at campuses around the country, the anti-globalization movement took hold as an anti-sweatshop movement. A group was formed, United Students Against Sweatshops, uh, they're now called USAS, and these students started to demonstrate uh, on the topic of sweatshops, particularly related to university branded apparel. So the students were concerned that if they have the name of their university across their t-shirt, uh, how do we know this t-shirt was not made? in what we think of as a sweatshop. How do we know that the working conditions are okay? How do we know that the workers are treated fairly? Okay. Now, this activist movement on college campuses, uh, at the time, seemed very fringe-like. You know, it seemed like kind of a fringe element of the campus community uh, that was concerned with this. Just as, at the time, the protesters at the WTO meeting in Seattle were kind of thought to be, well, those are kind of the, the crazy people. In other words, these weren't mainstream concerns. Uh, but now as I look back, uh, I have to give the activists credit because if you look at the recent past, what you can see is it's just the final chapter in a very long uh, historical story in industrial history. Activists throughout industrial history, including during the past few years, actually have changed our conception of what is normal and what is right. And this has been true throughout industrial history. Child labor, well that used to be normal and fine and okay. You want a fire exit in your factory? Well that used to be kind of a crazy idea. Do you want safe ventilation in the textile mill? Well, that was a crazy idea too. All of these things, from child labor to fire exits, okay, uh, all of these causes were initially causes that were fought by fringe activists who were outside the mainstream. 
Now, is anybody today in favor of no fire exits? Is anybody in favor of child labor? No, of course not. Because now what we think of as normal and right is that kids should be in school, not working in factories. So what the activists succeeded in doing is shifting public opinion, eventually shifting corporate practice, eventually shifting laws, and there the causes they were fighting for became no longer sort of nutty sounding, but instead became part of mainstream practice, uh, became what is right and what is normal. This is exactly what has happened with the anti-sweatshop movement in the United States that was founded on college campuses in 1999. The students that were protesting at Georgetown at the time sounded like they were asking for some pretty ridiculous things. They were demanding, for example, that Nike and the other companies that produced our apparel disclose where their factories were, the factories that they sourced from. And Nike said, well, that's crazy. We can never do that. You know, that's giving away our competitive secrets, so forth and so on. Uh, the students were demanding that there be monitoring of the labor conditions inside the factories. Well, that's crazy, too. You know, those aren't our factories. That's not our responsibility. The students were demanding data. They wanted to know what kind of violations were taking place in this factory, and they wanted to be able to evaluate factories on uh, social and labor issues. Okay. All of this sounded crazy in 1999. Today, really a very short time later, it's all pretty mainstream corporate practice. Okay? And so these students have really changed the way a whole global industry operates. And they have changed accepted normal practice. And so really I have to, when I think about the mechanisms by which things are getting better, I think a great deal of the credit you know, goes to this group of students. Just as 100 years ago, a great deal of the credit went to the labor activists who fought against child labor. Okay? Um, so I never, you know, as an economist, really doubted the power of markets to improve the, the human condition. Uh, but I have now a much fuller appreciation for the power of social justice movements and activism to accomplish the same thing. Okay. Now, I do need, however, to go back on the other side to square my kind of optimistic and positive story with an increasingly negative view of international trade here in the United States. If you've been listening to uh, Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton, you see an awful lot of defensiveness, an awful lot of backtracking, an awful lot of, well, you know, maybe these trade agreements need to be renegotiated, so forth and so on. Uh, the data bear this out. There's some recent survey data. Okay. This is from the fall of 2007, showing that Americans are increasingly skeptical of international trade. This question is, how many of us believe that international trade is very good or somewhat good for the country? Over the past five years, the percentage of people agreeing with that has dropped from 78% down to 59%. Okay. What's going on here? Okay. This is, by the way, a peculiarly American thing. Uh, the data for Europe do not look like this at all. In Europe, about 80% of the citizens in Germany and Italy and Denmark are supportive, are positive on international trade. Uh, they were positive five years ago, they're positive right now. So this, particularly public, this particular public opinion phenomenon is unique to the United States. Okay. My own view is that it's not a coincidence that falling support for international trade and globalization is correlated with rising levels, I think alarmingly so, of uh, inequality in the United States. The gains from trade are not equitably distributed, and there are many in the United States, unlike in Europe, without a safety net. Okay. My own view is that I think Americans do believe in the notion of trade as a way to create wealth, but they have reservations about how this wealth is being distributed. Okay. We may be getting richer. Okay. 
Uh, but maybe we don't see the way these riches are being distributed as being fair. Okay? Maybe too many of us have tenure while others are kind of looking in. Okay? Now, this was sort of a vague notion in my head, you know, the relationship between rising inequality in the United States and uh, the falling support for trade until about, um, it wasn't that long ago when I read about a very interesting animal study. And as soon as I read this, I thought, that's it. That's what's going on. Okay. Uh, let me explain this study. So we have a bunch of monkeys in the room. Okay. And the investigators give each monkey a pile of rocks. Okay. They teach the monkeys that if the monkey hands over a rock, they will get a piece of cucumber in return. Okay. The monkeys figure out the game very quickly. Rock, cucumber, rock, cucumber. Okay, this is trade, right? This is trade. You're giving up something you don't really want. You're getting back something good. From the monkey's perspective, they're getting richer because they're involved in trade. Okay. Now, there's no real reason for a monkey to stop playing this game, you would think, because they have no use for the rocks, but you know, they like the cucumbers. Okay. So what could be wrong? Why would somebody playing this game suddenly become opposed to international trade? Well, the investigators then changed the rules of the game. Okay. They took one of the monkeys who was in the middle, all the other monkeys could see this monkey, and instead of giving this monkey cucumbers for their rocks, they started to give this particular monkey grapes. Okay. Now, monkeys much prefer grapes to cucumbers. Okay. And so one monkey was getting richer a lot faster than the other monkeys. One monkey was getting a better deal than the other monkeys, even though everybody playing this game was getting richer. Now, ask yourself, what do you think happened in this little experiment? Is everybody just going to keep trading happily? Okay. No. Okay. No. Uh, in fact, the monkeys who were getting the cucumbers got very mad, and they started not only refusing the cucumbers, you know, basically saying, I'm not playing this game. Okay. It's not fair. Uh, they started throwing rocks at the monkey who was getting the grapes. Okay. Okay. And when I read that, you know, I had this moment where I thought, that's it. You know, that's exactly what's going on in the United States. People are opposed because they don't see the rules as being fair. Uh, too often in business, we have people, again, who have tenure, we have special interests, so forth and so on. And so, on. And so even though they realize that globalization, that trade, is making them richer, uh, they have a lot of hesitation about how the game is played and whether the outcomes are fair. Uh, so in my own view, I think in the United States, the very sharp increase in income inequality, uh, the disintegration of our social safety nets, is really at the root cause of a lot of the unease and the opposition to international trade today. Uh, I'm optimistic, too perhaps with a new administration that this can be un overcome. But I don't think that it's enough to try to tell people, you know, it's OK. Trade will make you richer. If they see the game as being fundamentally unfair, uh, just like the monkeys, uh, they won't want to play. Thank you very much. Okay. <clears throat>
The same religion that's capable of hideous acts of destruction can also be capable of moments of healing.